and um, uh, so they signed a peace treaty, a, a bakht. This is like traditional Islamic Sunni theology. And the bakht has 300 to, I think, 320 black Nubian slaves as part of it. So in order to have a treaty, you have every year they would give black, 300 to 320 black slaves to the Islamic empire. And that was the treaty. And this is well accepted in Islamic theology. But this happened after Muhammad died. Hi, my name is Imtia Shams. Um, I'm a whole bunch of stuff, I guess, but um, I'm one of my identities is like I, I'm an ex-Muslim. I left Islam. Um, I also founded a charity called Faith to Faithless, which helps all people who leave religions, like ex-Muslims or ex-Jehovah's Witness or ex-Hasidic Jew, ex-Christian. Um, and I also um, professionally, I, I have technology businesses. Um, and yeah, this is my video about leaving Islam, which I've never done before in this way. Yeah, so when it comes to like how I grew up with Islam, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I come from quite a religious Muslim family. Um, it's complicated to answer whether, you know, it was forced on you or not, because, you know, as a child, your family do make decisions for you, no matter what faith or non-faith you come from. But um, um, I would say that it was a is a mix of the both. So, you know, we're from a very religious family, but there's also, I also propelled myself into it because I really loved reading like, um, the uh, like stories the see the seerah the stories of the prophet and the, and the sahaba and also um just i was really into science and and if you come from an islamic background nowadays there's a lot of content that kind of ties the two together so it's not like there's a science versus islam thing necessarily there's also science and islam and particularly when i grew up that was a big thing you know you had um, you had Harun Yahya, for example, all of these kind of books that you'd be reading. I mean, he's gotten really weird, but back then he was massive, you know, and all of these kind of things. So I grew up very much within Islam, um, ritualistically. Yeah, we went to pray all the time and we did Tarawih and fasting and all that kind of stuff. I actually grew up in Saudi Arabia. So although I'm British, I grew up in Riyadh, um, you know, 12 years of my life. And then I moved to the UK to a very religious part of London, East London, um, for Muslims at least. Um, so it was very interesting that kind of juxtaposition between like growing up in Saudi Arabia and East London. And one of the things I say slightly jokingly, but not really, is that um, actually Saudi Arabia was more chill than East London was, right? Because in Saudi Arabia, you live in a theocracy, like it's a state government, Islamic sanctioned government. So people who are living in Saudi Arabia are more chill about Islam it's part of their like cultural and ritualistic identity, but it's not in the way that is in East London where you're like, we live in a kofar state and we have to fight for it, you know? So um, that was quite interesting, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and I grew up um, very, very, Islam was, is just how you see the world. It's just what you're interested in. And, um, but I did propel myself into it as well because you have different choices. You can grow up Muslim, but it's just part of who you are. And you can grow up Muslim and you really get into it. And I, I think I really got into it, especially from a young age. I remember like my first book was uh, Riyadh Salihin by Imam Nawawi. Um, I used to read it like a storybook, you know, you just, it's so interesting, like the story of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in afterwards and, and all that kind of stuff, because these are the hero stories you have as a child. You know, other people have nursery rhymes and these kind of things. And you have the hero stories of, of these people and, and they are hero stories, right? They're just like any other kind of story that you can grow up on where there are powerful um, ways to identify what's happening in the world today um, by looking into the past and, and looking into that moral framework that Islam gave me. I think in terms of like what, um, what, would the, what the selling point for Islam towards me was is a complicated answer because like you know, you know what, what the truth is back then like you, you know that oh it's because Islam is the truth but now I'm older and I've gone through this whole journey, like I would say slightly different things. So like now I would say, look, fundamentally the truth is most people are Muslims because we were born into it. Even if you become more religious than your family, even if your family wasn't religious, you have that connection of identity. This is why like the first thing you have to always know is like being born in a Muslim family is makes you biased towards Islam, no matter how not, you know, whether your uncle drank alcohol and stuff doesn't matter. If you're in that identity, it's always easier to go deeper in. Um, it's the same thing actually with Jews, uh, you know, if you're a secular Jew, it's, it's quite easy to get deeper into it by becoming Hasidic, for example, Haredi. Um, but yeah, I would say like, um, there was the element, I was just born into it as well. But 
beyond that, I've always had a very inquisitive mind about systems, like how does this work? I used to watch like how it's made, uh, which is like, you know, how factories make brooms and stuff. And uh, I was really, really into science. I mean, even today, like everything I do is technology and science and stuff, and I'm obsessed with it. I, I love dinosaurs, I love space, I love all of that stuff. So the thing is, Islam, particularly at the time, had such a wealth of like apologist material. So you had, you know, so much content that you can absorb um, that's like saying, no, 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 look, this thing that science is saying makes Islam true. This thing, you know, that, sci- you know, this thing that they're saying makes Islam not true actually makes Islam true. So an example of that would be, um, uh, you know, um, geology. The, the, you know, people would be like, well, what about the mountains as pegs, that, that whole argument? Well, there's, there, at the time, there was people going, no, 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 no. What the Quran says is actually uh, found by scientists, you know, and you had, um, you also had some like fraud type stuff. So especially from Saudi Arabia, you had... Um, Sheikh Zindani, who did like this back in the 70s, you know, these documentaries about science in Islam where he got the Western scientists in. Now, a lot of Muslims fell for that, yeah? And it was Saudi funded, obviously. And so um, for me, there was a lot of that as well. Like, you know, that was what stuck with me. Like, a lot of people would argue that the best miracle was the miracle of the Quran in terms of Arabic. But if you don't grow up with a classical understanding of, um, of like Fusha, like uh, classical Arabic, it's very difficult because... and. And fundamentally, I knew it was subjective. Like, I just, even as a Muslim, I just knew that this thing about the Quran being the best of poetry, it's very complicated to actually argue for that because it's subjective. And, and there's no way around that, to be honest. You can argue to your blue that it's not subjective. But for me, it didn't make any sense. Well, for what did make sense is what we could measure in the world and the fact that science had proved a lot of things. Uh, it made more sense to, 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 to use that as a basis for as part of the basis for, for, for believing in Islam, there was also the political aspect that how did a man from the desert, you know, end up taking over and his, his ideology taking over a lot of the world. Uh, and um, that got me into history. Actually, I got into history much later, um, like particularly like Sasanian history, like Persian history, Roman history, Byzantine history, blah, blah, blah. but um, at the time it was more like science, but with a bit of history. Um, and, and those are the things I could defend, while the, 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 the language stuff was a lot harder to defend because I'm not a poet, I'm not an Arab poet, I don't even know how to how to begin to define that. Um, so, yeah, um, it's a complex question for anyone to answer. Like, why did you believe something? But I think for me, it was those different factors, born, being born into it. There's a lot of content with science and Islam at the time, which is now still there, but it's starting to, like, dip because there's so much clear, I won't say a swear word, but you get my point. Um, and the historical aspect, which, again, even today, is starting to dip a little bit because there's so much good archaeological evidence coming out. So, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a whole bunch of stuff at the same time. Um, you know, for me, of course, science and Islam is not compatible. And, and to be honest, I don't even blame most Muslims about this because there was a big fraud. You know, there's, a, there's so much money thrown in into the science and Islam stuff from Saudi Arabia, but then it, it kind of got wider and wider that uh, from the Gulf countries, if, uh, you know, um, that it's not really Muslims who have been pushing this. It's been particularly like Saudi-funded organizations that have been doing this, this whole science and Islam thing. And they just stole stuff from the evangelical movement in the US. They stole all of the arguments that all of these Americans were saying, um, which was also funded in America by all these Christian, uh, like far-right Christian groups. So, you know, of course it's not compatible with Islam. Now, does that mean that I think that Islam can never be compatible with science? Of course not, because my belief is Islam is man-made. And if anything is man-made, you can always adapt it. So there are Christian scientists I know. When I say Christian scientists, I mean they're Christians, but their Christianity is very like Anglican, where it's like, you know, it's a metaphysical concept that doesn't really define a lot of their day to day, like how they view the world. So they're scientists and they have a, they're almost like deist scientists. Like they believe in God, maybe they believe in Jesus, but they don't think that that affects science in any way. And, and I think Muslims can go there. And in fact, I know personally some scientists who are Muslims who are much more like that, where their view of Islam is much more like metaphysical and their view of science is like, they're um, very separate. And I, I think, so that can happen. But obviously I think like Islam as it is now will not allow that because Islam is the word of God and therefore you have to apply that word of God to the to nature. That doesn't, it's not going to work out. Like, what are you going to do? Accept evolution? Well, you can accept evolution Islamically, but they always, what they do is that they say it's, uh, um, it's micro evolution, not macro. There's no, no such thing. Evolution is a, is a, is a, is a, is like a fractal. It's like, it's, it's, it's both things at the same time. And so they, they cut it in half. 
but what, that that's not science. Like any evolutionary biologist will will say that's ridiculous. So you know, there's always going to be a limit if you're um, if you're a very practicing conservative Muslim and you love science because you're going to have that tension. But I think that's a good thing. I think that that's often why young Muslims and even older Muslims have doubts. And I think science makes you know a lot of Muslims grow up in engineering degrees or science degrees. And I think it's important that. Um, we're learning about science because it gives us that tension that needs for you to adapt your faith to based on what you think is right, yeah, or leave it. In in the case of myself, I guess. Yeah. So my uh, my teenage years in terms of being a Muslim were really weird. <laughs> They're so weird because I grew up in East London. I'm in a very very religious kind of community in general. Um, I'm extremely interested in sort of the world. I was just hungry to learn more about the world and theology and philosophy and history and all that kind of stuff. And also Islam, because Islam is, forms part of that in my in my mind at the time. And um, um, but at the same time, like I, that hunger. So I always had questions. Everyone has questions. There's not a single Muslim on the planet that doesn't have questions. There's not a single person who's in the right wing of politics who doesn't have questions or the left wing of politics. Everyone has questions. Questions are not a problem. Even religions will say questions are not a problem. With Islam, you have answers to the questions, just like every other religion or political ideology. Yeah? You have lots of answers. The problem for me is, as I became more and more hungry for content and, and, and knowledge, the answers that I always had to these questions just stopped sort of making so much sense. So you go deeper. So an example of that, a very good example is Age of Aisha. Yeah, I, I mean, I had thoughts about that since I was like very, very young. But you also have answers to that, like, oh, no, she wasn't that age, or, or actually that was, women like hit puberty way earlier, or this is how they did it in the time. Uh, and lots extra, et cetera, et cetera. But as you get older, those answers, you go, wait, but that doesn't make sense because um, she was playing with dolls, or, or that thing about that's how they did it in the time doesn't make sense because Muhammad and Islam is for, supposed to be for all of mankind for all of time which means that at some point we've decided that that's unethical, you know? So the answers stopped making sense. And um, I think my kind of 18s to 24 when I left Islam uh, were very uh, tense without even realizing. I just knew something was a bit wrong. And so I dug in deeper. And this is something that a lot of ex-Muslims will tell you that actually it's when you... So, so for example, like I got very, very religious. Um, and I saw a lot of people even in my community weren't really engaging with Islam as much as I th thought people should. I was like, this is the truth. So like, why are we not digging in? And so I dug in a little bit more and um, at some point I kind of disconnected a little bit from Islam because the some of the things didn't make sense. And but at the same time, I couldn't say I didn't believe because how you, no one says that. No one says they don't believe. Um, so I kind of decided, you know what, I'm going to see the world a little bit. So I spent time talking to the people who are non-Muslims, which I didn't really do growing up. I spent a lot of time like exploring other ideologies. Um, I, I did like a lot of sociological studies uh, for university and stuff like that. I studied like things that were beyond the science realm. Um, logic, for example, I studied. And then I was like, no, 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 now I need to really dig into Islam because I knew Islam was true. So I was like, well, now that I've had a bit of an exposure to the world and these like wider ideas beyond what I grew up with, um, now I can go and find like the truth, the kernel of truth in Islam, that some of the hadith didn't make sense, and this, but there must be a kernel of truth. That was the downfall, because when you try to go back subjecti like objectively, which of course you can never do, but I was like, well, I was born Muslim. Like fundamentally, people are Hindu because they were born Hindu. They're Christian because they're born Hindu Christian. Um, and when you try to go back into uh, exploring Islam, knowing that you were born into it, and so saying, what would I think if I was not born into it as an outsider, if I knew the things I knew? That I couldn't do it. Like, I just could not accept so many things. And the more you can't accept, the more it grows. It just becomes a massive snowball of problems. And everything becomes, like, intertwined. So, you know, the stuff that, the problems I'm having with science and Islam, I was having also morality issues, like the age of Aisha, what Khalid bin Walid did, you know, with his kind of really dodgy stories about what he did, like as a as a as a as an important part of the Islamic story, what um, the way the the historical story is told that you had this amazing, beautiful Islamic empire for hundreds of years. Well, aside from the the Khulafa Rashidun, everyone else was we would not even consider them Muslims to some extent today. You know, they were like they were like doing whatever they wanted. The Abbasid Caliphate was like doing whatever they want, right? The, the Ottoman Empire, which is like a, you know, people use that a lot as like a look how powerful we were. Well, it was like basically a Kufar Caliphate. 
Um, so the more I dug into history, that also like just unraveled a little bit. So everything started to unravel and, you know, that was the hardest point because I didn't know you could leave it, of course. There's 1.6 billion people who I'm, what kind of arrogant person am I to think that I'm, I found something that other people have not, you know, and uh, I had people around me who are really religious and very important in the Islamic community globally. And I was thinking, how can I think I'm smarter than them? Because they're really religious. What's wrong with me, right? And that's a really bad place to be because you think you're crazy. You think I must be crazy, but I can't be crazy because I've thought about this and, and, and there's no one to connect with. I, I didn't know you could leave it. So I, I always, um, this is a part of my life that's very, very dark. So like I don't, the only way I can explain it, and I remember thinking about it at the time, like I was thinking, what am I feeling? And I felt like I was like in a black hole, like a bubble of like blackness. And I had no I couldn't grasp anything. Nothing was real for me, you know? And that was the hardest point of my life in terms of, like, this stuff. And it's what drives me a lot, like, in terms of, like, all the stuff I do for ex-Muslims. And a lot of it is just, I don't want that to happen. Like, that was horrible. And and it's stupid because, of course, there's people who've left Islam. But, you know, we're so isolated from everything. You feel so stupid and you feel crazy and you feel alone. And I just don't want that to happen for anyone else, you know? And And so... Uh, that was when I was probably 23. I was kind of an ex-Muslim secretly for a while. Um, I didn't know you could be, sorry, I didn't even know the word was ex-Muslim. I had no idea what I was. And then I found this place online, like on Reddit, um, called our ex-Muslim. There was only about 1,000 people at the time, maybe less. Now we have like 80, 90,000. By the time this video is out, probably have 100,000 videos. You know, this is how they're growing. But back then there was about 1,000 people, just a small group of like people like me, all of them were anonymous. Not a single person had ever met anyone else on that subreddit. And um, that's when things snowballed for me. Like, that's when I was like, okay, this bubble of blackness is not so black. In terms of how practicing I was, so, you know, um, no Muslim who says they're so fully practicing is fully practicing because it's impossible to be. The, the bar with Islam is so high. Um, but I mean, you know, so for example, I miss a lot of Fajr prayers because I find it so hard to wake up I would might maybe I'd do nuffle or something but like I fasted since I was seven years old every day since I was seven years old like till I was an adult um and I actually loved like like fasting um um thought are we I would do kind of the sun I would do like eight <laughs> found it very hard to do 20 um but I would go to Tarawi like all the time um um uh dawah wise like yeah uh, I always saw da'wah, like the best kind of da'wah is like da'wah, da'wah of action. So I always tried to like, and I went to a really non-Muslim school in the UK. Um, um, so, you know, there's a lot of like what I considered kuffar around me who are like, you know, decrepit. They're all like getting to drugs and gangs and blah, blah, blah. So for me, it was like, okay, I live the way, like the way I live is is a form of da'wah. So I, there was a bit of that. Um, yeah, and, and, and obviously I was engaged in to further wider DAO activities because of like my background but also because I was kind of quite aware of the science in Islam and the history and stuff like I also didn't preach in a way that was like you know not, none of the like YouTube style one it was much more soft it was much more interactive um, but that is actually quite powerful because it's quite disarming for people um, yeah and then I guess I also got into Islam politically a little bit I can't talk about too much of that on camera but I got quite politically involved as well um uh but uh that was towards the end of it anyways like yeah you know one thing that uh people often talk about is spiritual experiences and this is for every religion and you know in islam there's a lot of stuff about that you know like the energy that you have towards islam and i i, I remember like when people nowadays tell me like there's a lot of doubting muslims sometimes they come to me and and i don't want to move anyone to ex-muslim i don't not really massively interested in that there's enough people leaving i don't need to do anything but um they often talk about spiritual experiences they've had right and i always tell the story like i get spiritual experiences because i so i used to go umrah once or twice a year because i live in saudi arabia and my family wa wanted to do that a lot um and I love Makkah. Like, I, I loved Makkah back then. In fact, I haven't gone because it's dangerous, but I don't like that it's become very KFC because it used to be, like, kind of cool and very, like, you know, um, it did feel like the Ummah, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But I remember one time I went on Laylatul Qadr, which is, like, the holy, you know, there's three nights. Uh, one of them is supposed to be the holiest uh, night ever, like, ever, ever, ever. And, um, they, you know, they do the prayer and they were doing a prayer for rain. So there's a prayer that they do for rain and it hadn't rained, I think, in Saudi Arabia at the time for 10 years. 
and it started raining and it was like it was like late night and people were crying and it was like so emotional and I was like whoa you know like it's literally like a whoa experience and I, I think I was 12 13 or something uh, maybe a bit older and that was spiritual imagine how powerful that is that it's the holiest night or one of the holiest nights it hasn't rained for 10 years you're praying for rain and it starts raining right <laughs> like what are you going to think so I had the experience and and that experience is part of the human experience. That's very important. You can have that experience about non-religious stuff as well. And I've had that. And people talk about, you know, when they first um, saw their son or daughter, they had that experience. Or, you know, when they had the kind of success they wanted or, or you know, some coincidence happens. So it's really, really important to respect, uh, for me, to respect Muslims who come to me and say they had this experience because I believe it. I've had it. It doesn't mean that Islam is true. Um, and this is really, really important. Um, I think a lot of times people, especially people who are, um, trying to convince a Muslim not to stay Muslim, they say, no, 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 that, that's all coincidence stuff. And it is, but it doesn't take away from how powerful it feels for people. And you have to respect that if you want to understand why someone still believes in something like Islam. Um, yeah, but it was like, it's a totally trippy experience that, like, yeah, it was really crazy. And also it started raining and all the gas, because you have a lot of grasshoppers in, in Mecca, because you're not supposed to kill them. They all just went, Whoosh! so you had this big cloud of like grasshoppers. It was really crazy, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the things that may like lots of things make you doubt right because every time you look at something in Islam for quite a bit of it there's problems you know if it's historical stuff scientific stuff ethical moral stuff you know etc etc but, but like some of the big ones I remember is one was the, uh, the stuff around um, um, superstition so you know a lot of current day Islamic rhetoric is built around how you're not, you don't like the polytheists, like the Hindus and the idols and stuff. Well, we've got a Kaaba, right? And if you go to Mecca, you're literally circulating around the Kaaba. You're going doing, uh, doing um, you, you're going between Safa and Marwa, like the two mountains, and you're, you're, you're doing the things that often a lot of Sunni Muslims make fun of other people for doing, like the Shia and the, and the Hin Hindus and things like that. And you know, you'll say, okay, the Kaaba is just a representation of God. That's what the Hindus say, by the way. Like, if you talk to... A lot of Muslims don't seem to actually talk to Hindus. If you talk to a Hindu, it's not that they believe that the idol is necess necessarily, believe that the idol is like itself God. It's a representation of one of the gods. Um, and that was really weird because I was like, well, am I not just doing what we're accusing other people of doing? Zamzam is another example. It's holy water. Literally, you know, you'd look at Christians spraying water and, and like exercising demons and stuff and you, you kind of laugh at it, but we have holy water. You know, things like... Um, Black seed oil, you know, that it can cure all diseases but death and old age. That's a bit. That seems a lot, right? And these are things you have to believe. As a Muslim, you're not allowed to not believe in, for example, jinn. Jinn is a weird concept. The fact that we believe in literally ghosts, yeah, or, or let's say like, like, like spirits, right? You know, if you heard that in the Shinto religion in Japan, they have concept of animus. It's an animistic religion to some extent. You'll have this idea of like animal spirits and stuff. We, we might laugh at that, but we have jinn, right? And, and you know that jinn existed before pre-Islamic Arabia, and it's it's the same, you know, it's in... Those things were... Superstition was a problem, one of those. Ethics was a problem. Morality was a huge problem for me. So um, this... A lot of these things fit together. So, you know, I drew my sense of Islam from, hadith, from, from Quran and Sunnah uh, largely, because that's where you can trust if you're a Sunni Muslim. And that, that's all you need to go. That's all where you need to go. So, for example, morality, the story of Khidr, you know, where he took a child and snapped his neck, like he killed him. And it was like, oh, it's because he, at the future he would not believe and we'd replace it with another child. That doesn't make sense even today. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, the story of, then you can go to the Sahaba because I, I love the stories of the Sahaba. For me, like, they were an example of the best of humanity because that's what they're supposed to be, right? Like, Muhammad, Sahaba, Tabi'in, like, we will never get to that point. Cool, that's great, because then you can use that to benchmark, like, great, how good were they really? Just do some digging. Like, Khalid bin Walid is a very good example of this, because, you know, you grew up with this amazing story of this awesome warrior who turncoated from the Quraysh and became Muslim, and then because of him, won big battles. Yeah, but what did he do as a, what did he do later on? Like, they, Umar al-Khattab, his cousin, banished him because he, he, um, he killed a man's wife, and then, sorry, he killed a man's, he killed a man, and then married his wife the same day, even without the Idda period which you're not supposed to do, and yet he did it. And then Umar, because he was so powerful, Khalid bin Walid was so loved, he couldn't, they, he couldn't be uh, facing the, the justice of the Islamic State. They had to move him away. They couldn't get rid of him. You know? And there was a lot of politics involved. That just seems like today. It just 
there's nothing special about that, you know? And um, the morality around the age of Aisha was a big one for me. Just the role of women in society, you know, as a Muslim, I grew up with always the concept that men and women are equal, but they have different um, roles. But the truth is, you just need to go, it, even at a, at a high level into Islamic theology to be like, that doesn't make any sense, that's not true. Um, you know, most of the people in, in hell will be women. Um, you know, the covering um, of women is is something that men don't have to do. Um, the fact that you can have four wives, women are not allowed to do something like that. It's also another example. Okay, people will argue, oh, it's because there's lots of men dying in battle. Well, what about China and India today where there's more, by far more men than women? Doesn't that make sense? Women should be able to have multiple wives? You know, there's lots of, I mean, then the, you say, you know, the Pater, uh, you know, paternity and stuff, but these arguments break down quite easily uh, once you kind of get into it. Um, the, uh, LGBT was another kind of ethical issue for me because um, I grew up um, in a school where a lot of the non-Muslims, because mostly non-Muslim in, in, in East London, were quite homophobic, of course, like you're in from a white working class area. Um, and there's two friends of mine that were, um, I would say, camp. They were like quite fem effeminate, but they weren't gay. And they would be called, you know, F-A-G and they'd throw them, they'd bully them. And I hate, one thing I hate more than anything is bullying, you know. And Islam, like for me, it was a sense of justice. Like, you know, we need to change the world, make it better. So for me, that bullying was horrible. And so I had no, you know, I was very anti this bullying. Both of them turned out to be gay later on in life. And I knew there was not a single second they wanted to be gay. There's no way you'd go to a school like that and want to be gay because of society or something. There's no way. Um, so I was like, ah, sh like if I have a problem with them and the fact that they were made this way, because there's no way around that. They were made that way. I'm just as bad as the bullies. The only difference is I'm not throwing rocks at them. I'm, you know, my ideology is homophobic. It's, I, it's hateful ideology. So that was another problem because Islam has very uh, strong views about um, um, uh, anything that's that's non like like it's anything like that. It's very strong views about kind of LGBTQ and stuff like that. That was another bit, you know. There was a morality around um, just like um, the way the Islamic State and the caliphates were kind of structured, um, what they did. A very very good important point is slavery. So for me, I grew up always uncomfortable with what the Hadith were saying about slavery and also the Quran but largely the Hadith and, and who had slaves and, and all these amazing Sahabas who after the death of the Prophet when Islam was super powerful not just had slaves grew the slave, sl slaving trade within Islam uh, an example of this is the uh, Baqt of Umar al-Khattab with uh, they were uh, fighting in a, in a war um, in, in Dongkola with the um, Makurian no the, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was an empire in Africa um, as a, uh, it was a Christian empire, yeah? And Umar al-Khattab, and it was Amr al-Bin I think, who was fighting it. They, lo they lost, they, they stalemated. It was the first battle, actually, that Islam had lost after the death of Muhammad. And um, uh, so they signed a peace treaty, a, a baqt. This is like traditional Islamic Sunni theology. And the baqt has 300 to, I think, 320 black Nubian slaves as part of it. So in order to have a treaty, you have every year, they would give black, 300 to 320 black slaves to the Islamic Empire, and that was the treaty. And this is well accepted in Islamic theology. But this happened after Muhammad died. So if Islam was supposed to end slavery, um, why would Umar al-Khattab, at the height of his power, sign that? It, you know, this is the thing that, that just didn't fit if you really wanted to believe that Islam ended slavery. And then you can actually just follow history down, because you can go, okay, Rashidun, then, the, then you have the empires that came after that. The slave trade grew even bigger um, you know, and, and a lot of the slave language about history that a lot of Muslims talk about is wrong uh, historically. So, you know, they say that Islam was the first time that they brought ethics into slavery. That's just factually incorrect. Um, there was actually even as far back as um, uh, 2,000 years before Muhammad, there were actually 4,000 years in the, in, the, in the Sumerian Empire, there was um, examples of slave-related rights. They're not, they're not great, but they're rights of some sort. It's because slaves are economic property. And so, um, you know, uh, wherever you have economics, you have some level of rights. So yeah, this is another one. And there's also science. And there's so many things. And it's when you add them together that you get the kind of bulk of the problems. And it just, it just grew. And the answers didn't make sense. The first time I realized I wasn't Muslim was after probably months maybe even years of like just this build up, And um, I think I just snapped. My brain just 
woke up and I realized I was lying to myself. And I, I'm, my personality is, I'm very stubborn. Even now, I'm the same, you know. If someone, you can tell me as much as you want, but at some point, I just trust the information I've got. Uh, and the information was screaming to me that I just didn't, this couldn't make sense. Um, and then that was a three-month period. And that was a three-month period until I found the Reddit stuff. That three-month period was very difficult because it was this black hole and it's crazy. But um, that three-month period was me just going, well, what now? Okay, I don't believe in this, but what does that even mean? You know, and, and, and yeah, so that was, that was hard. Once I realized that there was other people, I was so hungry. And the great thing is, like, you can go on my subreddit profile and see from day one the comments. Like, seven, I think seven years ago now, you can go back all the way, seven years back, and you can see the first comments I made as an ex-Muslim. I've got another Reddit profile before that one because I did, that was, the first one that profile I had was a bit open and so I started towards the end of dieting it and then I was worried that I would get like stalked or something so I did another one. And the other one is where like I started like engaging with the ex, I made it largely for the ex-Muslim group and you can see seven years back like what I was doing and how I was thinking. You can see the language I use changes and all that. Um, and so I, I really like that because it's like a diary of what I went through in many ways. Um, it's a personal diary, I guess, but you can literally go through that. And it's, it's really amazing to see, like, for me, I've done it once before to see, like, how I really was excited to meet other people, but you could tell I was also, like, a little bit, like, shy and scared and stuff. And then that became, wait, wait, why is no one meeting each other? You know, and that evolved into, like, all the other stuff I did. But yeah. Yeah, the, the family and friends stuff was really tough. So... Well, it's really weird, actually. I went it the exact opposite way than a lot of people because I was helping a lot of people on the ex-Muslim subreddit tell their families if they were coming out or deal with their families and stuff, like secretly. Like, no one knew my name, but I was doing that. And then I actually spent a lot of time building secret groups around the world. So I, uh, I built a couple in the UK, um, one in Australia. Uh, I helped some people set up some groups in, in like Canada and the US, and they became massive, but that wasn't me. That was sort of them. Um, and so I was helping people, like, undercover, because I was like from such a religious family and from such a f religious like f clue around me that I, I couldn't, you know, come out as non-religious. So I was, I was giving all these people advice and I was like, well, I'm such a hypocrite because I'm still kind of deep in the closet. I was doing like meetup groups for ex-Muslims and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And some of my work started to, on the grassroots work, started to get like media attention. Um, but I was like in the closet. So like I would talk to them but with a secret name and like you know this kind of stuff and um at some point i just realized if i'm gonna do this properly and like trying to change things because it was so hard for me i have to be public about it in some way and so i started telling a few people individually um and yeah everyone responded so badly but they responded badly um even if they responded well so i remember i told some people in the university that i went to because i was part of the islamic society the isoc and, and just wider in that in that kind of circle. And I remember some of the people, like, they said they accepted me, but you could tell they were, they didn't know what to do because I was quite, I was like more the religious one, you know? So like, it was very difficult for a lot of people because it made them think, what the fuck, what, sorry, what does that mean? And then, um, um, and then, I, I, then what happened is that, um, I, long story short, I had to move back home for some other stuff, but um, yeah, and, I went right back into the closet, like at home, like I was really in the closet, but I was doing all the other things, you know, with this name, the secret name and propaganda that I had. Um, and I did my first Ramadan as an ex-Muslim, which I'd never done. And I fasted since I was seven years old, no problem, loved it, no problem. That was the hardest Ramadan I've ever done in my life. And I was like in my mid-twenties, so hard. It was harder than when I was seven years old because you just, you're not in it. Yeah, and, and I really felt the pain there. And um, after that Ramadan, and it's such a meme, this happens all the time, people come out after Ramadan, it's so common, well, in Ramadan, and um, as a non-Muslim. And yeah, and basically I told some family members, um, they were very terrified about how the rest of my family would deal with, because they thought like I'd hurt them and you know, all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of like me not telling people, but I didn't have a choice. I knew I had to tell people because of the work I was doing. And then uh, it came out to my closest members of my family by accident. Basically, I was questioned on some of the fact that I wasn't practicing so much because I had always been like, it was brought up like, you've been practicing since you were seven and you're doing things that you have, you know, that you've, you've, you, you're not doing things that you've been doing since you were seven. And I tried to 
like you just can't you, it's a lie it's it feels like a lie in your mouth in your throat you know and i just bleh. and it was a very very bad time uh i won't go into it but it's really really bad um i had to make a lot of decisions um but uh and then after that i just moved i, I moved into my own place and um uh, then i came out on facebook uh that was big because some muslims luckily like the ones that grew up with me they knew me they were like on the post because they had never dealt with an ex-muslim they were like look we just know you we we respect you no matter what and that looked really good but actually there was a lot of people who messaged me with really really nasty stuff and um they were often interestingly not very practicing themselves they were like political people but um and and it was very bad for them because when they did that to me i i started getting into theology i was like look like these are the reasons and you could tell they couldn't handle a lot of this information they've never really thought about it so they kind of walked away um but yeah that was very very difficult um i had a lot of um friendships break family weirdness and stuff like that but i spent a lot of time trying to fix that so i i go to all the muslim weddings I, all the weddings i can go to i go to because like for me i don't want to leave my community i grew up in a bangladeshi pakistani community in a muslim community also like i've not changed you know like in a in a in a drastic way um and i think like a lot of ex muslims they're so afraid for good reasons that they they you get pushed under the carpet you know um and i was like no i'm not going to let that happen so i spent a lot of time like trying to and there are, actually a lot of muslims have kind of accepted me now in my family even though my my community is so religious it's changed and you know it's changed in our time the word ex muslim didn't exist now every mosque in in redbridge in, in like during um during uh, Ramadan we'll talk about ex muslims and don't be an ex muslim but that's a good thing because it means we exist now and so um i think things are changing i think muslims are becoming they're realizing this is happening in their families you know and and you know you first react with anger but at some point muslims will start reacting with how do we deal with this you know and this is i think the stage we're starting to get into um and i i'm lucky to have seen that in my life like i think people are reacting differently to me um and every muslim has doubts so now what do they do with their doubts um and and they have multiple people they can talk to and so yeah things have changed um who knows what the future will look like though because you know um it's a we, people like me are an existentialist threat to a lot of these communities because if you're that conservative if you're like proper extreme or that conservative um the easiest way to keep people in is to act like nothing exists outside but we exist now and we're open about it so now what you know so things will change but who knows what will happen and i don't really know so i do think that islam has specific problems um as a specific system so it's not like so as in what i mean is that not all religions are the same in terms of like how it impacts the world and islam has two things it has a volume of people it has billions and billions poured into it from gulf money saudi money etc it's it's got political extremism attached to some elements of islam and you've got like a very orthodox view of how you interpret knowledge which is the quran is the actual word of god which christianity doesn't uh some christian christian beliefs have that but most don't um so it has that very very like it's a, it's a very classical system it's very orthodox and in fact um i would even argue that islam for a long while actually became more and more dis- dispersed um so you had the um um uh you know even during the rashidun you had like the rationalists and stuff like that the rationalist muslims and stuff and then you know with the later cal- caliphs islam just became very broad in what it could be around the whole world and it's only in recent times that we went back into this kind of classical view of islam for a whole bunch of political financial reasons etc so it has a specific i would say problem which is that muslims are taught that the word of god in the quran is the only true thing and everything else comes from that science is secondary to islam historical revisionism is, is like histor- history is secondary to islam everything is moral morality that we decide as human beings like what kind of age of child you can marry or the fact that you can marry a child or things like that or like who you can marry or who you can who you can love um how you interact with people who are not from your in group all of these things fall under that umbrella of islam and the problem is that that umbrella of islam is is whatever it says in the had- in the in the sunna in the in the quran exactly and if you're sunni particularly the hadith yeah and that inflexibility is the biggest risk in islam right now and um um i don't know if that will change because it's so 
it's so pushed nowadays because of all the money that's gone into these kind of old books and these Dar es Salaam, Sunnah books and things like that, that I think that it's very difficult to get people out of that. But human beings made Islam. That's how, what I believe. And therefore, it can change. And this is a big debate topic, obviously, within the ex-Muslim world and wider. Um, a lot of ex-Muslims that I know would disagree with me on certain things that I think, but, but that's good. It's healthy to have disagreement. My view is that Islam can reform in the sense that because it's man-made, there's a reforming element. Um, whether it whether it changes because of reform, whether it changes because most people start leaving it, I don't know. And it's an unknown. And uh, I always have these debates with some of my friends who are ex-Muslims um, around the world about this. Um, but yeah, it, it poses a very specific threat to the world in terms of particularly like conservative um, Sunni Islam because it's it's that inflexibility allows people to good people to make bad and unethical decisions about the world and that's dangerous and 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 it's dangerous if someone does it in a in a racist way where if you believe that somehow whites are better and you're not willing to change that view and you believe that you're right no matter what that's dangerous if you believe that uh, uh, Muslims are superior ideologically and theologically and therefore we need an Islamic caliphate you're dangerous because if you believe you can't change your position then that's that's a very dangerous position to hold and one thing I always ask Muslims who say oh but um, you know um, I'm willing to change my mind um, is they often don't understand the, the the risks that come with being ex-Muslims or if they do they sort of hide it it's very simple it's a very simple test I tell people what would happen if you leave Islam for one week public so what would happen yeah and they go, oh, you know, they, they, they often, that's what makes them quiet. But I say, try it because, um, uh, you know, if you, if you just think what a week, just a week of you telling everyone you're non-Muslim, what would that look like? Yeah. And that helps Muslims understand the reasoning behind why so few ex-Muslims are active out there and all that kind of stuff. Because they say, oh, but you know, Islam's the fastest growing religion, da, 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 da. But like, well, that's because of birth rates. Eh? It's not because of uh, conversions. But also, if you look at how many people can convert, convert, I guarantee you there's more people leaving Islam. But the problem is that you never hear about us. And, you know, and so it's a test. Leave Islam for a week, see what happens. Um, and then you can understand for one second why it's so hard for any ex-Muslim to do what they do. And why I personally think like, our biggest allies have to include Muslims because like they're the only people who understand how hard it is to leave it, to be honest. And if you're a Muslim and you know you have, a, you know, um, I'll tell you a little quick story. I was in Speaker's Corner. I wasn't there to debate anyone. I was there in Hyde Park and I got pulled because someone recognized me. And it was this like Jamaican uh, uh, brother, like his convert to Islam. He was quite extreme. Like it was very proper, like Jamaican convert became very, very hardcore. Uh, you know, caliphate should be in the world, da, da, da. And, um, he believed in apostates being killed in Islamic State. You know, they always say this. They say, um, uh, only in an Islamic State. You know, they say, no, no, apostates, you have freedom of choice. But when you dig, actually, in an Islamic State, I should be killed because I'm talking about it. And then I said, and I, as we were talking, I learned that he had two kids that he loved to bits. He's a human being. He has two kids he loves. And he said, um, and I said to him, what if your, your son or your daughter left Islam? You know, he had kids, they were little kids. And you could tell, he's, he was like, oh, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, you could just, he no, never thought about it. And I said, no, 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 no. I know so many ex-Muslims. I know probably more ex-Muslims than almost anyone. Like, maybe there's a few other people who know more than me, but I know a lot of ex-Muslims. A lot of people who are like you from a very religious background, it's their kids who leave Islam because they're the ones who dig into it the most. Uh, people like me as well. And I said, think about it. Let's say your son left Islam. Would you believe he should be killed in the Islamic State? And you could tell this man had never thought about it. And he had too much love for his kids to say that, to even say that word, which is very brave because a lot of people would just say that, right? But he just knew what it felt to say that and he didn't say it. And I think that's very important to humanize it and, and you know, make it a, a human thing because it's a human thing. Um, and, and so in terms of like my view on like what Islam, what Islam's problems are, it's that, it's that inflexibility. And it's a lack of voice, and it's a lack of voice because it's it's inflexible. This is, this is a, and this is why it's so important. We do more of things, things like this because it takes that flexibility. It adds flexibility. It forces it to be flexible, and that's going to happen no matter what because you can't stop people leaving Islam now. You can you can kill people, but there's too much videos of the content out there. There's too much written content out there. It's 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 a it's a it's a you can't stem the flow now, and so you have to deal with it. So yeah, a lot of people. Actually, back in the day, especially, a lot of Muslims would assume that you left Islam and became like a Christian, right, or something. But actually, like most ex-Muslims I know, 
just become non-religious. They become humanist, for example, and things like that. Um, that's that's what happened with me. So I, I I went through a bit of a de- deist phase where I kind of believed in God, but I didn't know what God was for like three months. At some point, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so then I, I'm like an agnostic atheist. I think that you can never disprove God 100%, but logically, I don't think that there's any evidence for God that I've seen, yeah? Um, then the question becomes, okay, so that's easy. I don't believe in God. But what does that mean about like moral framework and stuff? And so that's where I would say like, I like humanist principles, um, things like using rationality and science to try to question, answer the questions that are important to me. So an example of that is, you know, I believe that, um, I believe scientists when they say that, uh, that whales are mammals, for example, right? I can look into the science and I, I have enough knowledge to be able to dig into the studies, but I believe that because I, you know, framework. But humanism means that if it was important to me to figure that out, I would go into that and try to figure it out for myself. You know, and it's that kind of taking control of uh, and learning critical thought so you can kind of dig into quite important questions. So, and a good example of that is animals, eating animals and things like that. You know, I try to question everything now. Um, and so God is almost a boring question for me now. You know, like, of course, I don't believe God exists because there's too much else beautiful out there that I need to ask questions about and the God one is not that hard I think because it's about evidence for me and what evidence is there for God uh, you know the Islamic evidence for God is um, often brings Islam into it but if you separate Islam and God it's it's you can't be Muslim anymore so you have to be deist but being deist is so fluffy what does it mean right so I, I couldn't be deist um, so yeah, I would say I subscribe to humanist values as, as one of the things I believe in. I would say I also believe in like environmentalism as well as like climate change and stuff. And it's very similar. It's linked to, to humanism. Um, yeah, but, but, but God is a non-question for me at this point. And people often say, oh, just give it time. You know, it's been seven years now. I'm going to keep counting you know, to the end of, till, till I'm dead. It probably won't happen. Um, so Faith to Faithless was... Uh, my frustration with the fact that I had grown up without uh, and, and left Islam without any support. But also it was my frustration at having met other people who had left other religions. So I, I, I had a really good friend who was ex-Hasidic Jewish. And I remember like we were sitting in my kitchen at 3 a.m. And we laughed at how similar our families were, even though he's from a Jewish background, like a very, very Orthodox Jewish background. And I was from a very Muslim background. You know, he had the curls and the, and the hat and all that kind of stuff. Um... And like speaking to people like him, um, I had Jehovah's Witness friends as well who had left Jehovah's Witness and how hard that was being cut off from their family. Um, I was uh, I was part of the ex- ex-Mormon subreddit as well. Really interesting to see like how similar some of the theological issues they have are to Islam. Um, so yeah, so, so seeing all of these people suffering and all of these people saying the same thing, I thought I was the only one. Like that was the... That's the kernel of truth about faith to faithless. That was the thing that I really wanted to solve because I was like, this is so stupid. And, and nothing makes me angrier than stupid things, like stupid problems. This is such a stupid problem. Why is it that people leave these religions and think that they're crazy or that they're the only one, you know? And, and they often have the religion like creating systems to hurt them in, in whatever way it can to stop you from leaving. Um, you know, if you're a woman, in, if you're a Hasidic Jewish background, often the community will try to take your kids away from you if you've got children. You know, they'll sue you. Uh, they'll take you to court to get your kids off. Um, you know, if you're if you're from a Muslim background, and you leave, um, and your and your wife or your husband is still Muslim, they can take your kids off you. Yeah, often this happens in Islamic countries. So, so for me, this is a very very unfair situation. And so, Fatih Fatih was that. So Fatih Fatih's first thing was like, literally just putting lit- random people, not famous ex Muslims or ex whatever, just off the shelf human beings who've been through a journey and and having them speak. And by having them do that um, and not making it about egos or anything like that, it's just random people. You make it feel like you can connect to this person because it's just another person who's not anyone, right? They're they're, they're just people who've suffered something. And you listen to their stories and when you have, like, I I used to put, like, a Jehovah's Witness next to an ex-Jehovah's Witness next to an ex-Muslim next to an ex-Hasidic Jew next to an ex-Christian. And you see so much commonality between their stories. Uh, There's, of course, lots of difference. You know, for example, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you, I think you're more likely for your family to reject you if you're a Jehovah's Witness than a Muslim. I think a lot of ex-Muslims have some kind of relationship with your family. With Jehovah's Witnesses, you're not allowed to have a relationship with your family. If you leave, um, instead of fate, what's called fading, if you leave properly, you, they have to cut you out or they get kicked out. 
you know? So there's structural reasons why I think some things are different, but there's lots of patterns. And so Fatih Felis is about showing these horrible patterns that exist and trying to deal with that. That then evolved because Fatih Felis started off like that, but then it became more institutionalized, which is what I wanted. I wanted it to be like an organization. And so um, it, it got taken in by Humanist UK, which I'm a, I'm a trustee of now. And um, now it focuses a lot on also training the governments, the police, cha other charities, how to deal with X people, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been really good. Um, it's, it's grown massively. It's got a good reputation. Um, and I'm, I'm, yeah, it's one of those things that I'm proud of, you know, like I can die because I've done something that I, I'm proud of. Um, I also um, set up a new charity after Faithy Faithy. So Faithy Faithy, I'm on the board of, but I'm not running it operationally. There's lots of great people running it. I set up another charity to do education in, in other languages, in Bangla particularly, uh, on science, history, culture, education, because that was really missing. You know, if you're, if you're English speaking, you have the SciShow, PBC on, you have so many beautiful channels that you can watch to get science and history and culture. But in a lot of other languages, the content is really bad. So it's an educational kind of charity. Um, not really anything to do with ex-Muslim, but it's, it's an important thing. Like knowledge is, all of the things that I care about are like knowledge based. Like how do we make sure human, humanity kind of comes together and gets away from this kind of in-group, out-group and, and, and like, you know, um, hiding knowledge and making sure that we restrict knowledge so that people stay a certain way. I don't like that. So it's everything I do is in that. Um, so yeah, so I've kind of focused my life on that. Um, professionally, I have a number of tech companies around um, things that I think are also ethically interesting or whatever. Um, but so I like to build things, whether it's projects or companies and stuff. Um, uh, but I've kind of moved a little bit away from, I always had an end point with the ex-Muslim thing, which was like, I just wanted to solve what I thought was a problem and, and to like kickstart something with other amazing people around me. And, you know, it's been kickstarted and it's really changing things. So for me now, it's like, I've got other th things I also really, really care about. Education is a big one. Um, um, uh, political rights is another big one. You know, I, I've never touched political rights, but it's another area I'm really interested in. Um, um, so, you know, it's one of the things that I care about, um, but it's, it doesn't have to be everything, right? And this is a very important point for ex-Muslims. When you're in it and you're like angry, because of course you're angry, because the whole world is like trying to mess your life up. It's easy to think that you can never leave that feeling. And the truth is that over time, hopefully, when you have more room to breathe, you realize that it's one part of your identity and there's lots of another amazing things that you can make part of your identity. And, um, and that's healthy, you know, it's healthy to kind of move on a little bit, but also it's very good to keep one toe in because you can help so many people, you know, like you're filming this video, this is gonna help lots of people hopefully. Um, so. I love when people kind of leave, but also help. I've got some very good friends actually who are like that. They they have no reason to say anything about ex-Muslims, but they stay there because for the next generation, you know? And you never know their names. They're secret people, you know? They're on Reddit or whatever. And they give so much. So they're almost more interesting, you know, for me. Like when you moved on, but you're really helping still. So I think if you're a doubting Muslim, the first thing you need to do is give yourself some room to breathe. Because what you're doing at the moment is not weird. Lots of people have done it, but it's also extremely stressful because it's so linked to who you are and so linked to what you think about your future. And it's so linked to what you think about death. And like death is such an important part of what we think about uh, when we think about our lives. So of course it's gonna feel weird, but the key thing is to give yourself some room to breathe because there might be lots of people around you or lots of things you've put on yourself to say, I shouldn't think this or I should, or I should, I have to think this, you know? And, and the problem is if you don't give yourself room to breathe, you're going to go crazy. Like you're going to like really hurt yourself. And so it's just time. It's important to just make some time. You know, no Muslim would have a problem with this, actually. I think if you're, if you're, if you think about it, like no Muslim should say, no, don't give yourself room to breathe and think. Of course, even Muslims will ideologically say you should think. So take some time to think. Um, I think like it's really important you surround yourself with voices as much as you can. So that means everyone. So that means not just be in the ex-Muslim forums and things like that, not just being more liberal Muslim, but also talk to the people who are very, very religious, like have everyone around you because there's no reason to limit knowledge. Knowledge should always be open. And the, and the key thing is a lot of questioning Muslims, they go through different phases, but one of the phases is, I wanna hear nothing about doubts. You know, I wanna hear nothing, but you're just limiting knowledge, you know, or, or if, you're, if, you're, um, you know, if you're leaving Islam and you're getting to the angry phase where you're really, really angry, um, then to go back and try to debate every Muslim you can. That was also not really very healthy because you're not really doing that because you want to change their mind. You're doing that as a, as a sense of 
giving you a sense of, sense of control. And the reality is human beings don't react very well to if you're trying to force them to think your way. You know, just be kind and, and be kind to yourself. I think that's very, very important. The second thing is stay away from Islam for a bit. And what I mean by that is don't mean leave Islam. Go do other things. Often some of us come from very isolated communities and we maybe we don't have a Muslim friend, a really good non-Muslim friend or whatever it is. Like go and meet other people. The world is huge and there's no reason to be disconnected now. Flights can go into other countries very easily. Even if you live in a country where you can't get a visa to leave, there are, ex there are non-Muslims in your country. In fact, there are ex-Muslims in your country, but there's also non-Muslims. Try to expand who you know. If you're a boy, try to be friends with like girls. And if you're if you are uncomfortable with gay people, see if you can know people who are like from that thing. Just to understand, you know, the the no one should restrict knowledge. That's that's kind of my big thing. You know, you should really not restrict knowledge. And if you're questioning, you're restricting knowledge in any way, you're hurting yourself. You know, um, that's kind of the biggest point I would try to make. Um, and I think. It's also important to know, like, your gut, although you can't trust your gut because it's not based on evidence usually, you can follow it a little bit. So if your gut is telling you something and something feels wrong, so a lot of girls will say that they'll say, oh, something just feels wrong about the hijab, you know, or how I feel about some of the laws about women in Islam, but maybe they don't have the evidence base to say why. Follow that a little bit. So that means use that to guide yourself to knowledge. So if that's what it's being said, go and see that. And see if, if that gut instinct is true or wrong, right? Maybe if it's wrong, if it's wrong, then, then don't believe it. But follow your gut a little bit. A lot of people try to hide these things and it creates mental health issues. The th last thing I would say is mental health. Like, this thing will mess you up. Like, this, is, this whole space you're in is going to mess you up. There's not a single ex-Muslim I've ever met who's healthily left Islam without having to do some work. Like, I've never been to a therapist personally, but I mean, I probably should. But like, I've done a lot of pers introspective work because you have to. Like, initially you think you're fine, but because you have to, you're surviving. But at some point, you it catches up with you and you kind of need to spend time. So one of the best things I ever did was learn about mental health. Even if you just learn, again, it's knowledge, right? Like, go pick up information about what depression looks like. Pick up information about what PTSD looks like, complex PTSD. Da -da 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 -da. Learn all this stuff because that will be one of your biggest allies to understand how your brain works because the brain is very complex. We think it's perfect. It's really not perfect. It's really broken. We have biases built through like evolution and just society that, that you can't get around. So really understand how this thing works and, um, and just be calm. Like really try to build some mindfulness in your life, right? Like this all seems very fluffy, but it's solid. Like give yourself space. It will really, really help you make the, the jump that you want to make, whether that's to stay in Islam but be more liberal or whether that's to leave Islam, whatever you decide, that space to make that decision is what's really important. And a lot of people don't do that. They, they just jump one way or the other. And that space, you know, you've got, hopefully you've got decades to go. Take a bit of time. Um, and uh, the best thing is that there's ex-Muslims out there now. So if you want to contact ex-Muslims, like you can contact me. I, I get a lot of messages personally. I'm so busy. I, it's hard for me to respond to everyone, but my charity, Faith to Fearless, is fantastic for that. So people from all type of backgrounds contact Faith to Fearless saying, I'm alone or I'm having doubts, etc. And, and they get signposted to resources. Um, we also have, if you're in, in the UK, we have different groups around the, uh, around the UK, not for Faith to Fearless, for my own ex-Muslim stuff, but um, we can connect you to them. The other thing is Faith to Fearless also does like group, not therapy, but like support. Uh, it's very, very important. I think it's a very, it's surprising for a lot of people. It's the first time they've ever even said that to anyone that ex-Muslim, so... Um, so if you can contact Faith to Fearless, uh, just look for faithtofearless.com and you'll find lots of links in how to contact us. Um, and yeah, I, I just think, I just think there's so many of us now. Um, um, and one last thing I'll add is the subreddit www.reddit.com slash r slash exmuslim is one of the best places on the internet for exmuslims, I think, right now. It's got, I think, 80,000 exmuslims on it right now, you know, so it's a fantastic place. Um, so check it out.